السلام عليكم سيدي وعليكم السلام ورحمة الله وبركاته سيدي how does fasting make the body more strong weakness because of fasting is just illusion a mind trick how fasting brings the soul power how this source of energy is much stronger <laughs> question or was that a statement <laughs> Anything we do in the way of Allah makes us stronger. So we've described before in Rajab there's a lentil diet. In our earlier days is that was all the training and that was essential before seclusions because you live to eat. Means that every aspect of our lives you know it, you don't know it, they know it because they experience it. You, you live to get up and break your fast, that's why it's called break fast. And then you get excited, what well, am I going to have for breakfast tomorrow, today? And you have a routine, you get your coffee, you get your muffin, you sit down, you read your emails. <laughs> then you get excited what you're going to do for lunch and how you're going to have lunch and then what you're going to do for dinner and then you get angry if it's not that dinner and why you made this kind of dinner, you have to do this dinner. So our whole life revolves around eating. And you don't see that until you participate in the Rajab diet where you eat only lentil. They make a nice lentil soup, you can't alter the formula and you go 40 days on this lentil. One day is good, five days is good, seven days is okay, <laughs> right? Ten days is like, I can't take this anymore. She said, can I freeze these lentils? I make like a dessert from it. Can I make them cold so I can make like a salad from it? Because you don't know what to do with this. Your nafs wants to do something. Can I add sugar? Make it like a dessert lentil? So no, you can't do nothing. You just eat the lentil until you realize now you're having a harder time to eat. You begin to actually eat less. Some people lose 20, 30 pounds on a lentil diet because they're realizing that the the excitement of, of food is diminishing because it's the same food. So it's, it's Allah's way of letting us understand that one, how much your nafs is involved in your eating and how much it's a distraction in your life. Because when they begin to do that and they have their awrads, their recitations, the etiquettes that they're supposed to recite. As soon as they enter into this lentil by fourth or fifth day the importance of their food begins to diminish and the power of their zikrs are becoming stronger, especially in seclusions because that's the time of 40 days they isolate and Allah opens for them an ability to bring an energy. Most can't isolate and they can't but they can begin to experience that when I sit and meditate my meditation's stronger. I'm not hungry, I ate the lentils, I didn't want any more. But as soon as I start doing my Allah, 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 there's a lot more qudra because that desire of that food has dropped and now and it's, and it's, I'm still under the nutrition of it so I have a lot of energy from it and they begin to experience their zikr, their, their powers of the zikr, the energies that's coming from their zikr. So they realize that. That Allah if you bring down the food, Allah increases the power of the soul. So in reality if Allah wants, He can make it so you don't even need to eat because the sustenance is coming from the soul. That what you eat doesn't give you power. Mawlana Shaykh would describe these people who say there's power and calories are power and there's energy in this food. He said, if that was true then put the food on the table and see if it moves. It doesn't, that's just something that your body needs because that's the conditioning we have now. But there are others whom they have conditioned, their energy has such an abundance on their soul of energy that actually their soul begins to feed the necessity of the body that they don't need much. They can eat very little, little bit of water and they go. That's you know Allah's karamat can put upon anyone. So when they begin to fast and they begin to do their practices, then they may have a lot of energy coming upon their soul. So then the practices are best that when you're eating, 
when you're breaking your fast and you're going to be in jama'ah for taraweeh or you're going to be meditating and doing your, your taraweeh which is your qiyam al-layl, your nighttime vigil of praying 20 rakahs, when you do that and break your fast light. If you break your fast with a huge buffet, you will lose the, the realization of the energy of Ramadan. The energy of Ramadan it comes in Qiyamul Layl. So they abstain all day, they break their fast in a moderate way and then they begin to do their nighttime prayers. When they're doing their nighttime prayers and meditation and connecting, that's the time Allah is sending energy. And you feel the energy most when the stomach is not so full. After you pray your taraweeh then you can eat your food until your suhoor time because the energy points were not missed. But those are, those are the understandings of energy and what happens in, in Ramadan and how to catch that feeling. But people get a little bit too excited for iftar and they go all out and they don't feel the energy. So one way to feel the energy is eat lightly your iftar, have your coffee, your teas and what is necessary and then begin your Qiyam al-Layl and then after the Qiyam al-Layl then you can eat the, a bigger meal all the way to your suhoor, inshaAllah. As Salaamu Alaykum Sayyidi Walaykum As Salaam wa Sayyidi, Sayyidi can bio-resonance be altered of an individual using biometric information? Woohoo! That must be like your degree. <laughs> those people who biometrics and have those machines and <laughs> yeah. I don't need have to ask a a professional in, in, in that type of specific vocabulary, I'm not, uh, I'm not versed in that. But can your energy be changed? We have many talks on that. That's the whole concept of zikr. You are manifesting based on a frequency, one that is resonating within you and you resonate a frequency therefore you are. The frequency you resonate also determines your faith, your belief, your characteristics. All of it is based on a frequency, you sabbihu wa bihamdi, for verily everything is praising the Divine teaching. So everything, this has a resonance and now it appears as a piece of paper. So its atomic reality is that it's resonating, as it's resonating it's appearing as a paper. Everything has an atomic reality and every atomic reality has a resonance, a vibration. Zikr is a way in which to bring a heavenly resonance, an angelic resonance upon the soul. Well then we said before that is the sound, the energy, the light and the form. So everything is by sound. And this vibration makes an energy, that energy produces lights, these lights and atoms and quantum is now manifesting a form. So if the vibration changes you can begin to alter the form. So military will make a sound and they can bring down walls and that was in Old Testament, the, the horn of Jericho, the shofar, huh? Shamash is the one who calls those to the horn, <laughs> right? So they blew the horn and the walls of the city came down. And Allah says in Surat Al uh, Yaseen, say, Hatan Wahidatan, it's but one shout. So these are the realities of sound. So definitely, sound has an immense reality on form. And one of the other understandings is that when you attend the zikr, the shaykh is going to attune you to his light and his frequency. So he's been molded to a frequency which is a Muhammadan frequency and that's why they are Muhammadiyoon. They resonate at the frequency of the heart of Prophet and each to their degrees of what Prophet <coughs> is fine-tuning them. As a result, when Allah says, Fiikum in Qur'an that Prophet is amongst you. We've given talks before, one understanding when he's amongst you is actually these Muhammadiyoon, they're with you. 
they are resonating at a Muhammadan frequency. As soon as you chant and meditate or associate on their YouTubes, anything that you're doing because their haqqaiq is beyond space and time and has no relevance to, to they were at 4 o'clock or 3 o'clock, doesn't matter whenever you tune in that Muhammadan frequency is moving and it comes to the person and begins to change and alter their frequencies. As a result you become in tuned with the shaykh. If you meditate you'll achieve that much faster because you're also trying to bring your vibration, breathing, connecting and breathing. You're trying now to bring yourself into the attuning with the shaykh. As a result you begin to resonate at a much higher frequency because he's going to replicate himself within the person so that they become Muhammadiyoon and that their soul and the frequency of their soul is imitating that reality. That's why the shaykhs then gave awrads, why Mawlana shaykh has a, has a etiquette for us to recite because it's what he is reciting. So if you recite what he recites, you connect your heart with his reality he begins to send the frequency onto the servant and as a result they are then now replicating the Muhammadan frequency and the Muhammadan frequency is from Allah And that's how from Atiyullah, Atiyur Rasul wa ulul amri minkum is this direction, obey Allah, Allah's frequency, obey the frequency of Prophet what is with obi, ati. And obey the ulul am. When you do, they're pulling you up like a telescope because the ulul am riminkum takes you to his frequency, brings you to the Muhammadan frequency. In the Muhammadan frequency, if they can resonate, now they're into Allah's divinely frequencies and Allah's dressing. So everything is based on sound, the understanding of sound and light. That's why we teach from the world of light, not, not so much the world of form. They don't care for the world of form, inshaAllah. Uh, as salaamu alaykum Sayyidi Walaykum as salaam wa rahmatullah. Does repetitive thinking on an unoccurred event induce manifestation? Repetitive thinking on something that has not occurred and does it induce manifestation? That I think we had that talk on manifestation. Mm that you and people are, are very powerful creations. Anything that they put onto their heart and begin to want it, it begins to manifest. And submission is to ask that, Ya Rabbi I don't want what I want, I want what you want. And we said that you, what, what does submission mean is, I submit my will to the will of my Lord. I'm not submitting my will to myself. If I submit my will to myself then it's like the book called Secret. I want a parking space, <laughs> parking space opened. Okay but you start doing things like that you're no longer submitting to Allah and then Allah describes those people. Have you seen those people who make their desires their Lord? So I make my whole desire. And then I begin to bow down to it and now I'm, I'm idol worshipping and the idol is actually my desire. So this whole life of ours Allah says, I made you very powerful. Look at this world of yours, I threw you on this earth, there was nothing there except what Allah made and look at all these buildings and planes and everything flying. Why? Who, who did that? He said, you did that. I gave you the ability to manifest what you wanted from your heart, you build with your hands and look at your whole dunya. But if you use that power to want what I want then I'll let you into my kingdom and make you from my saints. And that's why the saints is, Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done. Means God's kingdom will come, Allah's kingdom will come and His will must be done on earth as it is in heaven. So His will has to come onto earth and it must be in submission as in the heavens. There's no arguing in heavens, only argument is here. So our whole life is to submit an immense power, immense power. 
And that's why when they have that power and they give it back to Allah and they give it back to our Lord and they see that they have good character, good character, imagine what then Allah is going to open for them because you pass the security test. But if you don't give the will back and you do whatever you want, they don't get anything. And they only get this material world and Allah's describing, you chose that on your 70 year life and I'm giving you all of eternity. So the etern eternal equation is what? Linear equation that has no beginning and no end. How would you mark eternity? There's no beginning, there's no end. But whatever you can imagine of it, 70 years is less than a dot. Because you don't know when you came and how long you're going to be going. But if you choose dunya and you want to use your manifesting power on this earth, you got 60-70 years as a dot and then when you die you're gone, you're in the wastebasket. Because all you wanted was to manifest your desires and you lost the entire eternity. Then Allah says, what kind of brain was that? What kind of thinking was that? I'm offering you the whole linear line of eternity that you will be eternal. Take the eternity, take behind what's curtain number one. Shalla. <laughs> As salaamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, Ya Sayyidi. Wa alaykum as salaam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Sayyidi, what is the reality behind the eight pointed star seen at maqams in Uzbekistan? <clears throat> the eight pointed star? Or two boxes. Yeah, that's one reality is five-pointed star, six-pointed star is, is the secret of creation and eight-pointed star, these are the two boxes, the two Kaabas, the Kaaba of earth and Bayt al-Mahmur in the heavens. And they represent the four authorities on earth and the four from the heavens and eight will hold the throne and one king upon the center. So that's one other reality that they would draw for these stars and, and the authority of, of the, the, the symbol of authority in those symbols of eight. That they're the upholders of the throne and the one king that sits within the middle of that Kaaba, Sayyidina Muhammad and represents that, that authority and that kingdom. And Allah sits upon the heart of Sayyidina Muhammad inshaAllah. <coughs> uh, as salaamu alaykum Sayyidi Walaykum as salaam wa rahmatullah Sayyidi, I heard something without a voice saying, look what is protecting the moon. Then I saw a huge dragon behind it as its protector. Very scary and fierce. Is there any truth to this? You saw in, in real life or you saw in, in vision? Heard something without a voice. Yeah, I heard something without a voice. Yeah, there are dragons everywhere that, that have to do with either it's a physical, that the dragons that are physically guarding and the spiritual reality of, of this station of sainthood, that the, guard, the guardian of sainthood are the dragons that Allah want to give Alim al-Qadir to a servant is going to grant them knowledge and power and as a result assigns for them a dragon to guard awliyaullah so that they represent, they represent the full moon of the reflection of Sayyidina Muhammad And we've described that before they did from Sayyidina Malik salam that the Zabani that are guardians of hell that Allah assign dragons to watch over them as they bring a paradise reality onto this earth. And Allah knows that without this security the shaitans on this earth would destroy them. So Allah brings from them paradise protection to guard them upon the earth. So these are the, the, the symbols of that guardianship which are the dragons and they're all around them 
and the dragon in the skies that are all around and continuously circumambulating all around as a protection. And in last days that many of these dragons will be seen because they'll enter into this realm to fight. Malik al-Jabbar, Ya Malik al-Jabbar. InshaAllah. As Salaamu Alaykum Sayyidi Walaykum As Salaam wa Rahmatullah. What will the time of Sayyidina Muhammad al Mahdi be like? Should be very beautiful. That comes a, a golden age that the world will fill with its fitna, its corruptions and every type of difficulty, wars and the earth will take itself to an atomic bomb, atomic warfare. And for 100 days of warfare in which the earth will feel that there will be nobody left because they're going to try to annihilate each other. And Sayyidina Mahdi comes to protect humanity. Those whom Allah has granted them to be clean and pure and have muhabbat and ishq and, and the goodness of their heart, Allah will make them to be mahfuz and guarded. And by means of guarding them for the arrival of Sayyidina Mahdi whom comes onto this earth at that immense time of, of need and that he will make four takbirs and shut all their technologies and all their, their warfare and their technical warfare will all be destroyed and will bring all the jinn that are operating those machineries and bring them down. And so that now everything has a chip on it and that chip is governed by a jinn and they're allowing these jinn to operate everything. So that when Sayyidina Mahdi comes, he's an immense power, so uh, electromagnetic pulse. They understand that technology now. You know you can send an electrical energy and you can shut down entire electrical system. Well imagine the energy Allah gave to the heart, it's not comparable to a, a, a Tesla factory. <laughs> If Allah give the heart of a servant and it's like a lightning, take an energy and everything will shut down at that time. And then become a different type of battle through the spiritual realm. And then from that become the killing of Dajjal and the Antichrist. And then from that point on becomes like a paradise on earth with the presence of Sayyidina Isa, Jesus Christ be peace and blessings be upon him will kill the Dajjal and bring peace upon this earth and will be 40 years of paradise on this earth and 40 years of a time that we can't understand its length, inshaAllah. So it should be an amazing time but most important is to live a life with that intention. I don't know if I'm going to get there or not Ya Rabbi but I'm asking with the intention that I won't to be there, I want to be with Sayyidina Mahdi Salaam, I want to be with Sayyidina Isa Salaam, Jesus Christ peace and blessings be upon him and to be of service to them, grant my life to be with them and my life in the service of them and if I should die before that happens Allah will bring your soul to be with them because that's the time in which the souls become visible and that the souls are participating in these events inshaAllah. Uh, as Salaamu Alaykum Sayyidi Wa Alaykum As Salaam Wa Rahmatullah Sayyidi, what's the difference between Qutubs and Abdal? Yeah, I don't really have to ask then, Shaykh. If you're a Qutub then you would know <laughs> and if you're an Abdal you would know but we'd have to ask them, this is their jobs. Uh, as Salaamu Alaykum Sayyidi Wa Alaykum As Salaam Wa Rahmatullah What is the reality of our passing? Will we automatically know what we promised Allah and the reality of the immense time we wasted? In dunya? If you're in tariqah or not in tariqah, if you're in tariqah, the tariqah means the path in which to fulfill what your promise was. 
that was in the talks two nights ago of the bayah last week. Why Allah brought you into the tariqah was to fulfill and bring you to real Islam. Real Islam is based on your bayah, your allegiance. Without the allegiance there is no Islam. So that's somebody whom Allah didn't really guide, brought them to barakah. But when Allah want to guide the servant then he takes them to the tariq, the path, istiqamu fi tariqat which Ayatul Kareem Allah adhere and stay firm upon your tariqah because that tariqah is going to bring you into the reality of Islam and submission. And that then is the, the reality of, of reaching our ahad, our covenant in which Allah sent us onto this earth. Do you remember I sent you onto this earth and everyone had a mission and we said, yes, but how would you reach that mission if you didn't have bayat? So then you took bayat to confirm and that's why Allah in the words of the bayat is that, don't leave it. You leave it to the detriment of your own soul because it's not a holding his hand and say, oh, okay, I'm not, I don't want to hold his hand anymore. This was your way to Allah and that was your adherence to the love of Prophet to confirm what you promised on the Day of Judgment. If I don't get to that point with, what did I promise my Lord on the Day of Judgment? So each shaykh is bringing the student to that adherence. How? By who knows himself will know his Lord. How would you know what your Lord wants for you and you don't know who you are? See the system how it plays? When people are thinking, I'm going to come to you and say, oh you, you're a plumber. You promised Allah you would be a plumber and you would be doing <laughs> that. That's not, you know, shake telling people what they're going to do. You be a big rock star. He wants to be a rock star, he's got long hair now. So you, yeah, and you're going to be like Cat Stevens, you're going to sing these songs and you're going to be so famous. No, that's not what Allah wants. So it goes all in a system that how, what is all by hadith of Prophet Teach them to know themselves. When they know themselves, you know, that they begin to realize who they are, then that's everything. That's huge the hadith is who knows himself, araf al nafs, when you, when you know who you are, you know your nafs, you know your character, you begin to learn who you are, Prophet described you're going to find your Lord. Didn't say Allah. Is going to find your Lord, you're going to find that which governs you, right? So that's, oh, I'm looking, I'm finding myself, I find all these desires, oh how these desires, these desires are governing me. That's not what I promised Allah. Then you begin, oh I was going to do this, I was going to, I was going to accomplish all these things for my akhirah but I only accomplished for my bank account. That's not what your promise was with Allah so it means then you have to do muraqabah, muhasabah. As soon as you do your muhasabah and accounting, you're connecting, connecting, I get to know myself, I know myself and oh Ya Rabbi I think I'm just going left and right. And then the servant who does connect and does meditate, does contemplate, Ya Rabbi what did I promise you? And when you begin to ask that you cry all night long, what did I promise you? And then Allah begin to talk to you that whatever you promised me, you'll never get there with this character. So let's work on your character first, so it's the whole system, right? Who is it? Ad Ilham, Adham, Adham, Sayyidina Adham mm. was supposed to be a big wali, he was a big king and he was lying down doing very not so nice things, looking at his palace and through the skylight and he saw, he said, what's up there? He saw so camel on his skylight. And he ran to the thing, went up to the palace thing, went up onto the palace and, and, and said, what is the camel doing here? And there was a, a gentleman there and it was a, a <laughs> so what, are you, what are you doing here? What, how did you get on my palace and why are you on this skylight? And it was, uh, make the story short, it was a calling from the heavens and say, look whatever your station is, you're not going to achieve it on that down there with whatever you were doing down there that you had promised Allah something else, now come to your calling. So Allah had to give him a miraculous sort of vision from an angel walking with a camel on his roof 
to shock him to come up. But the, the lesson here was he had to walk away from his kingdom. And he's, he understood that this kingdom is not going to make me find Allah This dunya has distracted me in, in running for the wrong thing. Um, I've been focusing on the wrong thing and look how it's all just garbage. This dunya when you collect it, it's a bag filled with rotten things. And he realized and walked away from it said, that's it, I'm not going to achieve anything like this. What I'm trying to conquer of dunya, I, I, I want to run for Allah and he walked, he walked out of his palace and took a, a life in which to follow Allah and, and to serve Allah So that one hadith alone who knows himself will know his Lord. So this is why all of muraqabah is to connect, connect and then begin to cry at night, what did I promise you Ya Rabbi? And the first voice you hear I guarantee is that whatever you really want to know what you promised me, fix your character. When you fix your character, you're kind, you're gentle, you're listening and you, I've scrubbed you knife, enough in your life, now listen to me. And they begin to listen and they begin to cry and as a result Allah begin to open their heart to understand what lordship they have. Lose all those lords, all the dunya lords, you lose all of them until the Lord Rabbil Ala begins to appear within the heart of the servant. That they left all that and the Lord Most High begins to appear within their heart and begin to draw near. When you begin to draw near to Allah well then it's very clear who you are, right? If you're drawing near to Allah it's going to be very clear who you are. You'll begin to know, all the inspirations will come into you. That I'm supposed to adhere, I'm supposed to draw near, I'm supposed to be good, I'm supposed to have all of these akhlaq and characters and then your God-given talents in Allah's way will begin to appear. And that's the responsibility of the shaykh, right? Did you promise Allah that you would be singing for thousands and hundreds of thousands of people in a stadium? Or you'd be singing the praises of Sayyidina Muhammad So that's what everyone has a skill, ability, a word, a gift and those gifts were for, supposed to be for Prophet But shaitan has hijacked everybody's gift and using it for himself and for, for, for whatever nefarious purposes people want to use. That's the symbol, so a generous person has always been generous. But he's just been generous with the wrong things, he goes and does everything for everyone. But that wasn't what Allah wanted, said, use that generosity towards Prophet So as the person knows themselves, they'll begin to understand who they really are and what they promised Allah inshaAllah. <coughs> Very easy sim system, there's nothing even complicated about it. <coughs> As Salaamu Alaykum Ya Sayyidi Walaykum As Salaam Ram Tullah Say, what is the adab to use the candle for meditation? Adab? adab. Turn it on, light it <laughs> and then cover it and turn it off. Be careful with candles, especially if you have kids and houses burning and leaving them and you forget and the curtain catches on fire, God forbid. But as soon as you light a candle for worshipness and ibadah, Allah makes an angel to appear and that angel continuously preys upon you until your worshipness is finished. So this was the hikmah and the wisdoms of, of lighting candles because it's a, a symbol of Divine ishq and love and Allah bring a, an angel in that flame and begin to make all of the du'as of what your worshipness to be accepted. So then the hadith and the beautiful hadiths that Prophet would describe that nothing dear to Allah than somebody old or in a room dark with a little candle reading Qur'an. Why? Because as they're reading and being blessed, the angels also praying for them. Mm -hmm. That they woke in the middle of the night, they can barely see and they're reading through the light of the candle in their worshipness. So alhamdulillah there's a lot of… everywhere we look Allah giving infinite opportunity for blessings. So it's all geared to give us immense blessings, not for punishment but Allah gave every opportunity possible to receive blessings inshaAllah. Mm -hmm. As Salaamu Alaykum Sayyidi Walaykum As Salaam wa rahmatullah. 
How is it possible that both Fana and Baqa, the Jalis, dress a one single individual when they are different ways? How is Fana and Baqa? Because you have to die to be reborn. The Fana is at the, the Qab Sir, Sir Sir and Khafa. So you have Fana and Baqa in that understanding, means that one is a death where you die and what you've entered into is only existing and the baqa is like a resurrection to bring you back, right? So if you, if you're, if you're shut the energy down then that's like a fana, you ceased. As soon as you ceased that which you love is now manifesting in you. And when Allah bring you back in baqa means now you've been resurrected with a frequency and an energy that brought back. That's why Sayyidina Musa said, Yet me see, to see you my Lord and Allah said, you can't see me but look to this my signs, my greatest of signs and my glory. As soon as he looked entered into fana because he qashiya, he died, he went into the reality. Mm. Then as soon as the time of that was finished, Allah revived him in baqa on awwala muslimin and then now he repeated. He wasn't the same Musa His something else came back in from that reality and said, now testified and gave his shahada because saying, ana awal al-Muslimin, Muslimin that I am under the Muhammadan banner because what he witnessed of that reality and then brought back. So then the fana and the baqa is a continuous state, at every moment the servant is dying and at every moment Allah is reviving. And this is one of the miraculous states of the number nine. So for our, our numeric scientists who understand numbers, one of the miraculous realities of nine is that, that nine multiplied by anything annihilates it and brings it back to nine. So this is a miraculous nature of nine and many other mathematical realities of nine. You add it, you subtract it, comes back to nine. Whatever you do with nine it actually brings itself back to nine uh -huh. and when you add all of those up it actually takes itself down to zero. So it represents the reality of Prophet as the perfection. And there is nothing beyond that reality and at the same time it represents a zero and a nukht because it represents complete annihilation. And the one whom is completely annihilated in the Divinely Presence actually represents the Divinely Presence. But the one whom is too present represents nothing because they only represent themselves. InshaAllah Subhana rabbika rabbil izzatama yasifoon wa salaamun al mursaleen. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, Muhammad Muhammad al-Mustafa wa bi siri Surat al-Fatiha.